أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم uh, brothers and sisters I hope that uh, you guys are doing well um, first and foremost I wanted to take a moment to congratulate the brothers and sisters on the birth of our beloved third Imam, Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba Salawatullahi wa alayhi As you know, we'll continue with the tafsir of Surah uh, Yasin as we've been doing throughout this month of Ramadan. I hope that this 15 days that have passed by have been a good 15 days for you. It's been a, hopefully it's been a milestone, a, uh, you know, a stepping stone, I should say, in our spiritual growth as we prepare uh, to go through the nights of Qadr and the nights of A'mal and uh, those special nights uh, together, inshallah. So as we normally do, I'm going to do a quick um, review of uh, what we had discussed up until now. Um, of course, I'm not going to go through everything. We discussed just a little bit of the last uh, session that we had. And then I will move on to uh, what we will be discussing uh, for today, uh, inshallah. So we said that Surah Yasin consisted of four main parts. The first part had to do with the prophethood of the prophet. Second part had to do with the story about the three prophets that came to their people and how there was this mysterious character who tried to convince the people of those three prophets uh, to believe in them, but he was not able to do so and that those individuals, those people actually took his life. That's why the Quran says, I wish my people knew this was after he left this world. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told him to enter into heaven. And we mentioned that that heaven was the heaven of Barzakh, not the heaven of Yawm al-Qiyamah. So the second part is the stories, uh, the story of those three prophets. The third and fourth part, uh, the third part was about the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for us in this world that leads to us concluding his existence. And number four was the return and of course Yawm al-Qiyamah and the details with regards to that. So we are right now, we are we are right about verse 40, 30, 43 ish, so to speak. So we have now finished two parts out of these four parts. We talked about the prophethood of the prophet uh, in Nakalamin al Mursalin, as the as Surah Yasin says. And we also talked about the, the story of those three uh, prophets as well. <clears throat> and that continued all the way up until verse 30. Uh, what can we do these people whatever we send towards them the only thing they do is they take our message lightly from that point on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started talking about his signs this earth that is dead and then we revive it that's one sign and we've put gardens of grapes and dates in it that's another sign and then he continued, he said, Subhanallah, this is verse 36. Subhanallah, khalaq al-azwaja kullaha mimma tumbitu al-ardu wa min anfusihim wa mimma la ya'lamoon. Uh, flawless is the one who created pairs from everything, from human beings, from animals, from, from things that grow from the earth, wa mimma la ya'lamoon, and from things that they don't even know about. Meaning that there are pairs in things that even human beings don't know about. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ اللَّيْلِ The night is another sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرٍ لَهَا ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ The way the sun, the positioning of the sun. وَالْقَمَرَ قَدَّرْنَاهُمْ مَنَازِلِ The positioning of the moon as well. Moving on. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمْ أَنَّا حَمَلْنَا ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ فِي الْفُلْكِ الْمَشْحُونَ The fact that we have ships, the fact that water can carry that type of weight. وَخَلَقْنَا لَهُمْ مِن مِثْلِهِ مَا يَرْكَبُونَ وَإِن نَشَأْ نُغْرِقُهُمْ فَلَا سَرِيخَ لَهُمْ وَلَا هُمْ يُنْقَذُونَ And these guys don't understand that if it wasn't for us wanting them to use these ships and wanting them to use the water in their own benefit in this way, إِن نَشَأْ نُغْرِقُهُمْ We could have just had them drown. فَلَا سَرِيخَ لَهُمْ And then they would not have had the ability for anyone to help him or help them. إِلَّا رَحْمَةً مِنَّا وَمَتَاعًا إِلَا It's only the fact that we have, out of mercy, we have allowed them for a certain amount of time to benefit from the blessings in this world. That's verse 44 that we have reached. Okay. Uh, As-salamu alaykum to everybody 
who's with us, brothers and sisters. So for today, inshallah, we're going to move on from verse 45. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّقُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَمَا خَلْفَكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ When they're told that you need to be fearful, taqwa means to be wary of something or fearful of something. اِتَّقُوا مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَمَا خَلْفَكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ The rest of the sentence is not mentioned in the Qur'an. And this is something that happens quite often in, uh, in Arabic. Well, they just mentioned the first part of the statement because the second part is very clear. Uh, when they are told to be fearful of those things that will come in front of them and the things that are behind them, uh, they don't listen to us. That part is not in the verse, right? Um, now, there's discussion. What does it mean when the Quran says, ma bayna aydikum wa ma khalfakum? Long discussion, right? Now, Mufassirin, uh, some of them have chosen this opinion that ma bayna aydikum refers to the punishments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might send to someone in this world. وَمَا خَلْفَكُمْ refers to those that he might send in يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ Other mufassirs have different opinions on this. This is just really up for debate as to what this refers to. Moving on to verse 46. وَمَا تَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ إِلَّا كَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِدِينَ There's no sign that we send these guys except they do i'rad of it, they turn away from it. It doesn't matter what sign we send them. Whatever we do, these guys are turn, going to turn away from us. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ A sign of them turning away from us is this. And this has this verse has a little bit of a discussion. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ when, when they are told to give from the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them, they tell the believers, Why should we give food? Why should we feed those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can feed himself if he wants to? Now, what are they exactly saying? Right? And then they continue in Antum illa fi mubin. This is still the kuffar saying this to who? To the mu'mineen. You guys are lost. Right now, what is what exactly are they trying to say? What they used to say is this: that when the mu'minin used to tell them that you have to give away from your wealth, there are poor, there are people who are less fortunate than you. Right, you have to share your wealth. In response, they would say this: they would say, "You guys have a Lord who's powerful. Powerful. You have a Lord who's wealthy. You have a Lord who you say has the utmost mercy. All of these things. Well, if He has all of these things." Why should I have to feed the poor? Why doesn't God just do it himself? Right? And it's very interesting. In Islamic history, you will find that there were people who made the same argument with regards to other things. One that I remember in particular was the issue of Khilafat. That when the issue of Khilafat after the Prophet came up, uh, after the Prophet passed away, came up, there were those who said that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted Ali ibn Abi Talib to be the Khalifa, he would have made him the Khalifa. And yet he did not, practically, right? And therefore that means he doesn't want, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want Ali ibn Abi Talib to be the Khalifa, right? And this is a mix between two types of wanting, two types of willing in uh, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a theological discussion um, scholars have this discussion in in the uh, in aqaid in our belief system, and I want to open it up just a little bit. When we talk about God wanting something, there is two ways that God wants things. Sometimes He wants something and He makes it happen on His own, right? Like He wants the sun to come up from the east, for example, and He makes it happen, right? Sometimes He wants the sun to go down on the west, and He makes that happen, and it's done, right? Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something indirectly in the sense that he wants it, but he wants you to be the one who is going to do it. Mixing these two with one another can lead to some very scary conclusions uh, that, that we can draw, just like this conclusion that I mentioned uh, before. This is important why the same discussion comes up, brothers and sisters, when we are talking about ayatul tathir. Right? If you look at the Qur'an, when we talk about the status of the ma'asumin, right? There is a very famous verse, verse 33 from Surah Al-Ahzab, which is also Surah number 33. Okay, there's a verse that uh, pretty much every uh, Shia knows, right? Assalamu alaikum to anyone else who's joining. 
Every Shia knows. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتُ وَيُتَهِرَكُمْ تَتْهِرًا Right? God wants to purify you guys. Now, if you now understand the difference between how God wants things and how God wills things, right? If you understand the difference between these two, now when it comes to the verse of Tathir, you can understand them in very, you can understand that verse in a diff very different way now. Why? Because when the Quran says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ when the Quran says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only wants you to be purified, Ahlul Bayt, He only wants the Ahlul Bayt to be purified, you know that He wants things and He wills things in two different ways. Sometimes He wants things and He wills things in the sense that He is recommending for you to do it. He tells you, I want this, but He wants you to do it. Sometimes, no, He does it Himself, like raising the sun or the sun setting, for example, or all the different things that we find in nature. These are all uh, examples of things that God wants and he does himself. He makes it happen, right? He doesn't wait for you to see if you're going to make the sun come up or not, right? He wants it and it happens, right? The verse says, only you, Ahlul Bayt, we only want to purify you guys, okay? So what type of wanting is this? What type of irada, what type of will? Is this, is it the type of will and irada that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking for people to do? Or is it the type of will and wanting that he is going to do himself? Which one of these is it, right? You can't say it's the type where he's asking people to purify themselves. Why? Because that type of asking, that type of wanting is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for everybody, not just the Ahlul Bayt. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants everyone to be purified in this sense that they don't do wrong things. Right? I mean, that's what religion is for. Religion is your path to not doing the wrong things uh, that, that, you know, the, that you're supposed to stay away from. Right? God doesn't make it happen himself. He asks you to, to make it happen. But that is something he wants for all people. However, the verse is saying, I only want this for who? I only want this for the Ahlul Bayt. So this wanting is of the second type. The second type where he makes it happen himself. And when we talk about the infallibility of our Ma'asumin, we talk about the fact that there is no impurity in them. We talk about that they are yutahirakum tathira, they are completely purified. That comes from this discussion. That that wanting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of the second type of wanting where he doesn't sit around, right? He makes it happen himself. That's why it's, it says, I only want this for the Ahlul Bayt. Because it's a different type of wanting, right? It's a different type of irada, as they say. It's not the type of irada like he has for all human beings where he asks them to change their actions. And then he waits to see, are they going to act upon it? Are they going to make it happen or not? It's not that type. It's of the second type, right? So understanding these two types of wills that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, these two types of iradas, as we say, that he has, makes a big difference in Islamic theology. Nonetheless, these kuffar here are saying, why should we feed people if God can feed them themselves? Well, of course God can feed them himself, but he's waiting to see if you're going to do your part. He's waiting to see what you're going to do about this situation. Right? Now, another very interesting part in the verse, another in interesting point about the verse is this. It says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَغَكُمُ اللَّهُ Give, but don't give from your own wealth. Right? The Quran doesn't say give from your own wealth, although, although in other verses it does say that. Here it's saying, give from the things that God gave you. Right? In other words, you don't even own this stuff. And in other verses of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا جَعَلَكُمْ مُسْتَخْلَفِينَ فِيهِ Give from the things that you guys inherited. In other words, this wealth that you have today, listen, this was someone else's a couple days ago, a couple years ago, a couple generations ago. You are now inheriting someone else's money and someone is going to inherit it from you too. So while you have a chance, give away from it because technically none of this is yours anyways. Right? That's what the verse is saying. That's why when Musa alayhi salam was speaking to Qarun, he used to tell him, Ahsan kama ahsan Allahu ilayk. Do good the way God did good to you. This wealth that you have, if it wasn't for God's uh, work and uh, God's uh, help and assistance, you wouldn't have had it. And of course, Quran, uh, Qarun, Qarun, not Quran, 
uh, he saw it as his own work, right? Uh, he said that, no, this is coming to me from my own ilm, from my own knowledge, right? From my own insight. That's how I've been able to gain uh, this wealth that I have. So it's interesting that the Quran will tell us to give, but reminds us that, listen, when you're giving, this is the type of giving where God is really taking from one pocket and putting it in another pocket. Because when he gave it to you, it wasn't yours really in the first place. It was someone else's. Then they move on. And this is... Uh, basically, now we are moving on to the uh, third chapter of uh, Surah Yasin, right? Uh, forgive me, the fourth chapter. From this point onwards, we'll have to do with the fourth chapter, Yawmul Qiyamah. وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And they say, when is this day of judgment that's going to come? If you guys are telling the truth, if you guys are really truthful, these prophets, why don't you just tell us when the Yawmul Qiyamah is going to come, when the day of judgment is going to come? The Qur'an replies in response to them. Listen, the only thing you guys are waiting for, the only thing that awaits you is sayhatan wahida. Only thing that awaits you is one loud sound, one loud call, one loud cry, you could say probably. When that loud crowd, that loud cry basically comes, they will still be doing khisan. They will still be basically fighting amongst themselves, arguing amongst themselves. Arguing about what? They'll be arguing about this dunya. They are so stuck in this dunya that they won't even be paying attention to this loud cry before it comes. They won't be anticipating it, right? Quran says, uh, they see this cry in Yawm Al-Qiyamah as something that's very far away. So they're not anticipating it anytime soon. But we see it as something that's going to happen very soon. right? And then it's beautiful in the Ahadith, because this Yanduruna illa sayhatan wahida is referring to the first time that the trumpet is, is blown into. right? We know that the trumpet is blown into twice. Um, other verses of the Quran talk about it in the in the wording of a trumpet. Here it's talking about it in the wording of a sayha. But these are both referring to uh, the same thing. Hadith from the Prophet says this. He says that this, the starting of Qiyamah, the sayha and the starting of Qiyamah, it happens so quickly in his words, تَقُومُ السَّاعَةُ وَالرَّجُلَانْ قَدْ نَشَرَ ثَوْبَهُمَا يَتَبَايَعَانِهِ it says that it happens so quickly, I can see people right now, they have taken their fabric, they have moved, opened up their fabric because they're trying to sell, buy and sell the fabric. Before they can gather this fabric, Yawm Al-Qiyamah has started, right? Meaning that it happens pretty much in a split second. That's why the Quran says, يَأْتِهِمْ بَغْتَتَانْ This Yawm Al-Qiyamah will come their way as if out of nowhere, even though we keep telling them, <laughs> we keep telling them that it's going to come, but it's going to come as if it's coming out of nowhere for them. Okay. And then he continues. He says, it'll be, it'll happen so quickly that a person might take some food to put it in his mouth before the food gets to his mouth from his plate or from his dish to his mouth. The day of judgment will start before a person can feed his cattle. He takes the food and he's going to feed his cattle. Before he can do that, the day of judgment will start. Right? So it happens. This is something that happens quickly. Before, before we know it, uh, uh, God forbid, uh, you know, if we get, if it, for us, uh, if we're oblivious of it, then you'll feel like, oh my God, what's happening? Verse 50 continues. فَلَا يَسْتَتِعُونَ تَوْصِيَةً وَلَا إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِمْ يَرْجِعُونَ This happens in such a way where they feel so ambushed that they will not even have a chance to do tawsiyah. Tawsiyah means when you recommend something. You know, in the movies, you've seen like the final moments of a hero's death, right? Now, in the movies, they make it like really long usually. And by the, per by the time this person dies, he has a full dialogue with everyone there, right? Tell them I love my family and tell them I love, you know, this person and that person and all this kind of stuff. Quran says, when Yawmul Qiyamah happens, no. Uh, this is something that happens very quickly. The day of judgment happens very quickly, right? They don't even get a chance to sit there and tell other people, this is what you should do, this is not what you should do. They don't have a chance to do that. 
they also don't have a chance to go back to pu uh, to uh, their families because what these guys used to do especially the arab of that time they very much used to rely on their ahl they very much used to rely on their tribes right if they ran into a problem what would they do they will go get their tribes and people still do this today and not in the form of tribes anymore they have connections they have family members they have you know uh, relatives things of that nature the quran says wala ila ahlihim yarjaun they won't even have a chance to go back and get help from anybody it's done yawma yati they will come on that day fardan they will come one on one uh, assalamu alaikum to everyone who's who's joined us from the philippines happy to have you with us uh, brother hadi is asking does allah feed people like making it happen uh, what about with dua? Dua has its own role to play and then feeding them has its own role as well. Both of these are things that need to be uh, done. I am not sure if I understand Brother Hadi's question properly. If you could reword it, uh, that would be great and I could get back to that question inshallah. Moving on. Verse 51. Then we we blow into this trumpet again. Then all of a sudden from these graves, these guys are yansilun. All of a sudden, these guys are moving quickly. Now, this scene that the Quran is describing, where we blow into the trumpet one more time, and all of a sudden, all of these people who are dead, they rise up again, right? And they start moving. Might be similar to some of the stuff that, <laughs> I mean, we might imagine that it's similar to the stuff that we see in the movies sometimes, right? With the dead walking or like zombies walking and stuff like that. But one major difference, brothers and sisters, between the two is that in those movies, those guys are still pretty much dead, like, you know, in between life and death. They don't really understand what's happening. They're just walking. No, the Quran says when people come back to life on that day, the second, tr when the trumpet is blown that second time, uh, people are very much aware. That's a major difference that you will see in the movies and books and media, how they portray the hereafter, whereas the Quran portrays the hereafter. In the Quran, you are very much aware. You are much more aware of what's happening than you were in this world. That's one major difference that you will find, right? They are moving quickly towards their Lord. Surah Zumar, verse 68 to 75, discusses this whole topic more in detail. What happens when the trumpet is is, is blown? Um, who are those who don't die? There are those who don't die, right? There's discussion with regards to that as well. Uh, Sheikh Amin, inshallah, will have uh, the Death and Barzakh course again for those of you who are interested on uh, June 15th and June 16th if you're living in Dallas. I don't know how many of, of you guys are who are listening are living in Dallas right now. But if you're living in Dallas, he's going to have that course, inshallah. You can go on mizaninstitute.org and you can sign up for that course that's a course i'm just being very honest you don't want to miss that one because that's that one's a very very interesting one and it's one that we all we all have to deal with sooner or later right death and barzakh and i will say this most people as far as i've seen anyone who comes out of the course is usually happy that they attend it usually um they walk out being happier uh than than they were uh going into the course so but moving on, that was verse 51. So when these guys start moving towards their Lord, what do they say? They actually have a mixed reaction. First they say, قَالُوا يَا وَيْلَنَا Say, oh my God, what's happening? مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ مَرْقَدِنَا Who raised us from where we were lying? Right? Who raised us from our graves? So the first reaction that these guys have, and this is most people, that they are surprised and they don't know. They're in shock, as they say. Right? And then when things settle down, they remember. Oh, this is what they used to tell us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to raise us from the grave. And the prophets were telling the truth. This one ayah is two different reactions that they're having uh, on that day. Initially, they're in shock. Then things calm down. They say, yes, we remember that the prophets had told us about this. The Quran says, In kanat illa sayhatan wahida, fa idha hum jami'un ladayna muhtarun. All of these guys are there. The second time we blow in the trumpet, all of the guys are there. They are present 
uh, before Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala. Verse 54, فَالْيَوْمَ لَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا وَلَا تُجْزَوْنَ إِلَّا مَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ On that day, no one is going to be done in justice. وَلَا تُجْزَوْنَ what a, what a key verse this verse is. وَلَا تُجْزَوْنَ إِلَّا مَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ And no one will be given anything other than what they did. Now, when you look at this, brothers and sisters, you find that this idea... That on Yawmul Qiyamah, on the Day of Judgment, we are rewarded or punished based directly on the things that we did is something that you will be able to find clues and signs of this all over the Qur'an. It's not just here in the verses of the Qur'an, right? Here the Qur'an is saying, you guys will not be given anything except the things that you have done, right? Now some people might want to say this is figurative speech. Right, Because I'm not really going to see my action on the Day of Judgment. I'm going to see the reward or punishment of my action. But that's not what the verse is saying. If you want to look at the verse in a literal manner, the verse is saying you guys will not be given anything except for those things that you did. And then when you look at the Quran and Hadith and you delve a little bit deeper, you find that that is exactly what the truth of the matter is. That when people show up on the Day of Judgment, it is their actions themselves that show up. Why? Because our actions, they have a physical aspect. They also have a spiritual aspect or spiritual existence. That spiritual existence will show up on Yawmul Qiyamah. This is why we have Hadith. That for example, certain verses of the Quran that people recited will show up as human beings on that day. And we'll approach the person who recited that surah of the Quran, right? We have multiple hadith about that, actually. We have hadith that when you are in the, when, uh, you know, when you're in the grave, inshallah, after 120 years, a thousand years, inshallah, uh, when we are in the grave, that the psalm of a person will show up, the fasting of a person will show up, the salat of a person will show up, the prayer of a person will show up. Sometimes in other hadith, it says that the patience of a person will show up. And then when these people show up, and of course these people are, there, are are the actions of this individual, they will make the grave bigger for this person. This person, him being in the grave, he will be, he will have more room in the grave in the sense that the grave won't be pressuring him as, as we read for some other individuals. So we have multiple ahadith and multiple verses of the Quran about this. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that I will punish you, or this is my punishment. Those are statements that we might have to say, we have to explain them in such a way that technically it's not that God is punishing us because he's mad at us. No, it's not because of that. He is just simply showing us the reality of the actions that we had committed in this world, right? So if we find verses like that, we would have to point to those and say that those are figurative speech. Why? Because you have to understand the Quran talks to people of all sorts of intellect. For some people, you can talk to them and say, hey, there's a reality to your actions and though the reality of your actions are going to show up on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Maybe during the time of the Prophet, people would not even understand that, right? The intellect of the human being is limited and has grown over time. But maybe at certain times or even today, there might be people who if you tell them, listen, the way things work is that God, if he's happy with you, there are blessings and there's heaven and he's not happy with you, you know, there's punishment. Maybe they're just able to understand that. They're not even able to understand that actions have a reality and that he's going to show you the reality of those actions. So the Quran, this is one thing that we have to remember. The Quran talks in so many different ways because his audience or its audience is so diverse people of all ages people of all cultures all societies right so it has to be understandable especially when it comes to the fundamentals for people of all uh you know uh, from from all walks of life uh, as we say that might be one reason why the quran also speaks in that way where the quran attributes the punishment sometimes to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself but we know the reality is that that punishment is not coming directly from him. It's coming from our actions. Maybe he attributes it to himself because he's the one who has authority on that day, right? Maybe it's because it's a day where his authority is there and because the punishment is happening on that day, it, that's maybe why it's attributed to him. 
but we know that hellfire is nothing but our actions, right? I just want to clarify that and make that clear. Moving on, verse 55. Inna ashab al jannatil yawma fi shughulin fakihun. On that day, the people who are in heaven, what a beautiful description this is. The people who are in heaven, they are fi shughulin. I don't know if you've had this experience, and in the month of Ramadan, you might have had this experience actually. There are times where you might get involved with something. And it's such a pleasurable experience getting involved in that action. It might be a hobby. It might be reading a book. It might be watching a movie. It might, it might be anything, right? It is such a beautiful experience while you are doing that, that while you're doing it, you forget about time and time starts to fly by. This is me. This is, this is when we say you're so busy. You're having such a good time, right? You're so busy. Time starts to fly by. The Quran says, um, the discussion, the point that I want to clarify, and inshallah, once I clarify this, I'll end uh, inshallah. If anyone has any questions, uh, you can let me know. All right. Let me just, I just want to make sure we're back. Are we back yet? I think we're back. Okay. So, okay, perfect. Um, so we're back. So the point, point that I wanted to clarify is this. Hum wa azwajuhum fi dhilalina ala al-ara'iki muttaki'un. Them and their, you know, uh, many of us would look at azwajuhum and say their wives. But zawj, as I mentioned in Arabic, can mean any pair, any group of people who are together. So the question is, who are these individuals? And is are these individuals the same wives that they had in this dunya? Uh, is it those same wives that are going to be with them in the next world as well? When we look at the verses of the Quran, you find two different approaches to this. On one hand, the Quran says, yes, if there are people who are amongst the believers, we will have their wives join them or their husbands join them. Because when the Quran says zawj, it can go both way. It just refers to the couple. Doesn't mean that there is like, you know, when you say their zoj will be with them, doesn't mean like the husband is in heaven. We're going to send the wife to join him. No, it can be the other way. The wife could be in heaven and send the husband to join him, to join her. So it does say that in some verses of the Quran. Some verses it says that we will have their children join them, for example. On the other hand, the Quran says no. On that day when people show up, فَلَا أَنْصَابَ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ There's no uh, family ties on that day. Nasab means that you, you have no family ties on that day. You don't have no, uh, basically, the, your genealogy is not even there, right? Like you don't uh, attribute yourself to a certain tribe, to a certain family, to a certain group of people. وَلَا يَتَسَاءَلُونَ And on that day, people don't even, they don't even ask about one another. So how does this work, right? When you look at uh, what our scholars have explained about these verses, you will find this. They have told us that when people show up on that day, they are of two types. There are those, uh, or let me explain it in this way. When people show up on that day, they have no family ties amongst themselves based on the ties that they had on in this world. They do have family ties amongst themselves if they come from the community of faith, or the community of disbelief. Based on that, they will have two different types. They will have family ties. What does that mean? That means on that day, if there's a person that I didn't even know in this world, yet he is from the community of the faithful on that day, I will feel like I know that person on that day. Right? So there are family ties. The family ties are not based on who you were born from necessarily. They're based on the type of faith that you had. Right. That's why in that famous hadith of the Prophet, uh, he said, Ana wa aliyun abba wa ummah. He said, me and Ali are the fathers of this ummah. Right. And we take this in the sense of figurative speech. Right. He means that like he's so kind to the ummah. That's why he's like the father. Right. But if you look at it, it can be taken in a very literal manner as well. No, he is the father of this ummah because that's how the relationships work on that day. The one who has the most faith is gonna be at the highest uh, level or whatever is gonna be like the 
father. Maybe Lady Fatima will be like the mother of this ummah, right? Um, and the people in this ummah, if they are amongst the community of faithful, then they will be like brothers and sisters. This is why Hadith says that when uh, people, the believers, they are like brothers and sisters who have been born from the same mother and father. In other words, this thing that we say, you guys are brothers and sisters, this is not something that's figurative. It's literal. Yes, not in this world, because in this world we don't see it. But on that, in that world, yes, all of a sudden there are family ties, but based on other things, not based on who you were born from and things of that nature. So if I am in heaven, can my wife and my husband and my children join me? Absolutely. If they're the good type of people, if they're bad people, you will not even want them to join you at that point because you look and you don't see any type of similarity between yourself and them. You'll see them as strangers. You'll still know that this person was your, you know, your relative in, in the past world, right? In, in, in this world, you'll still know that. But will you feel a closeness to them? No, you won't feel closest to them because they're a bad person. Their badness comes out when you see their badness on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, their evil on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. You don't feel a closeness to that person anymore. In this world, you feel a closeness because that evil doesn't show itself too much, right? If Hitler was your cousin, would you feel, uh, you know, be like, yeah, I want to spend some time with Hitler? I don't think so, right? Similarly, other individuals, if they're bad, their evil comes out on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and then you don't feel that closeness uh, anymore on that day. Okay, so as the Quran says, hum wa azwajuhum, yes, if they're good people, yes, or their wives will be with their with them with them, their husbands will be there uh, with them as well. Verse fifty-seven and fifty-eight. I'll mention. I'll end. Lahum fiha faqihatun wa lahum ma yadda'un. Over there, they have, uh, you know, they have fruits and anything else that they want to have. Right. So it's not just fruits. Salamun qawla min Rabbin Rahim. He mentions this. As the last point, the biggest blessing that they have on that day is that their Lord, the one who was looking forward to seeing them, he is saying salam to them. He's pleased with them. This is the biggest blessing that God has ever had in heaven, right? That's why in the verses of the Quran, it's mentioned that you guys, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the mu'mineen and mu'minat that you guys are going to end up in heaven. In there, there is masakin and tayyibah, there's beautiful houses, there's all this stuff. And then it says, "What is one of min Allah akbar?" And the fact that God is pleased with them, that's also there. That is akbar. That's the biggest blessing that you can have. Inshallah, there's more points regarding that. Uh, the final point that I made. Inshallah, we'll continue our discussion in our next session. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, please keep us in your jaws and in your prayers during these nights. Please do share these recordings with anyone if you feel like they might be interested uh, learning about the Quran. We do. We are in a situation where a lot of us don't have access to these books of Tafasir. Some of them because they haven't been translated. Some of them uh, because they might be a little difficult to understand. That's why we're having these sessions because this is an opportunity that we get to discuss the meaning of these surahs uh, from at, at a at a level that it's understandable uh, for all of us. Uh, a reminder for those of you who live again in Dallas that we will be having the Death and Barzakh course uh, June 15th and June 16th. Uh, the, uh, you can register up on the website from right now and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. That course has been a very successful course. I think we've had it in almost, I want to say 15, uh, 15 cities, if I'm not mistaken, something around that number. Alhamdulillah, it's been a very uh, successful course. Thank you very much. Take care. Wa alaikum as